The joy of the Lord is my strength. Somebody just thank you, God, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Are you, are you thankful for God today? Come on, he's worthy to be praised in this place, God. So before we do anything else right here, why don't you just go ahead and lift your voice and say, God, I love you, and I'm thankful for all that you've done. God, I bless you today, honor you today, worship you today. You are good, God. You do good things for your people, God. And today we bless you, God. We worship you. Now, on the count of three, make a noise like you never had before. One, two, three. Jesus, we love you. Hallelujah, Lord. Come on, ready? Put your hands together. I have this hope that is my anchor. The wind and waves may rage, but His word keeps on holding me. This peace beyond all measure, and I found the joy that will never fade away. I'm gonna declare that I've got, I got joy down in my soul. I've got a peace that it won't end. I can be rising higher. I got joy. And now I stand redeemed Cause His blood has washed me clean I know the man who's conquered sorrows oh, He's the joy that I found that will never fade away Cause I got joy down in my soul I got a peace that it won't The river is rising, rising, rising. The river is rising, oh, let it rise. The river is rising, rising. Come on, declare it out. The river of joy, the river of joy. The river is rising, oh, let it rise, let it rise. joy this evening. Lift a shout of praise to the King. We thank you, Lord, who you are. Yes, Lord. Come on, he's a good father. Are you thankful for him today, Jesus? We love you. So on the on the day of love, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great thing to be able to celebrate the God who is love. Amen. First John 4, 7 and 8, I believe. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, because God is love. Are you thankful for the God of love today? He is the God of love today. Come on, so right here, why don't we just say, God, this? We thank you, Lord, for your love. 
God, your love is so overwhelming. It's so big and so massive. God, you loved us when we were unlovable. God, you drew us, God, when we needed you the most. And we're so grateful, God, that you loved us and gave your best gift, God. And so today we stand strong in your love, God, and we declare that we are yours and you are ours, God. God, you are a great Valentine today, God. We love you. Jesus, we love you. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, oh yes, when brokenness and pain is all I know, oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Come on, sing it out with us if you know it. Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Stand in your love. Oh, shame no longer has a place to hide. And I am not a captive to the lies. Thank you, Lord. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, oh I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Oh, my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your stand. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Stand in your love. We thank you for your love. I'm standing in your love. Oh, there's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out the grave. There's resurrection power. There's resurrection power that can save. Stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. We're standing in your love. Oh, I'm standing in your love. Come on, if you're standing on the love, the rock that is Christ Jesus, that love he gave us. Thank you, Jesus, for your great love today. Can we just take a moment here and just say, God, we love you. We love you so much, God, Jesus. It may have been a busy day. But today I just want to declare, God, I love you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength today, God give you my best today here's what I'd like to do for this uh, for this moment that we have in his presence for a little longer here but we're just going to open these altars and we're just going to express our love to God to say God I love you I love you I love you I love you with all my heart my mind my soul my strength so if you want to just join us to get together here in these altars just make your way forward we're going to we're going to worship God together with this this part of this song is this Father in heaven, you know I'm longing, you hear my every thought and prayer, I bring you my heart and all my affection, and I long to love you.
softly sing it to the Lord. And oh, how I love you. Bow down before you now. We adore you. God, I adore Just for a second here longer, just the truth is God, I love you, worship you. 
You deserve, God, we offer our worship to you, Jesus. You deserve it, God. We bless you. We honor you. We declare you king. You are Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah to your name, God. We thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Just stay right where you are just for a second as they play. I love the, the last 15 or 20 minutes we've been here expressing our love for God. But aren't you glad that we're in a, a relationship? A relationship means it's, a, it's two-way. And I just, as, as we were coming to the end right there, I just felt like that the Lord wanted to say something back. Just close your eyes and open up your hands right there. Your heavenly Father just wants you to know that he loves you too. That he loves you with an everlasting love. Not based on your performance, but based on the fact that he chooses you. Somebody here tonight just needs to hear that no matter what the day was like, no matter what the week's been like, no matter where you feel like you're at in your journey, your Heavenly Father says to you tonight that you are the apple of His eye. No one brings Him more pleasure than you do. Just put your hand over your heart, on your chest right there. The Father says that nothing can pluck you, nothing can pluck you out of the palm of His hand. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, height nor depth. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of the Father. He loves you with an everlasting love. There's nothing that you can ever do that will cause him to love you more. He loves you to the maximum right now. Father, we thank you for your love. Father, we thank you, God, that you chose us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He came and he gave his own life that we could be free so that we could know you and we could be in relationship with you. God, you're such a good father. You're such a good father. No matter what your what stage of your life that you're in tonight, you know, whether you're single and young or maybe you're widowed and uh, later in your journey or ma- whether you're married or, or whatever part of life that you're in, just in this moment, The presence of God is here to communicate to you how special you are to the Father. He made you. He breathed his life into you. All the days of your life are written in his book. And he's prepared a heavenly place for you that you'll spend all eternity with him. Isn't that good news tonight? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand tonight. As you're moving back towards your seats, I, you know, I don't know how we do this. At least say something to somebody and wave at them and say, hey, it's good to be back in church. It's good to be around, whether you fist bump or whatever. Welcome tonight on this Monday night. I was talking to s- some folks earlier, and I, I, don't know if, I don't know if I've ever been in an actual church service on Valentine's night. Maybe I have. I know we've probably done some marriage banquets or whatever, but... This is just church tonight, so thank you for coming out tonight. Um, Powerful time of worship. Do you believe that God has something he's going to impart into your life tonight? If you don't believe that, you can start believing it now. Uh, Faith changes things, and so uh, welcome everyone. I see we've got Camden folk here, and we've got Pine Bluff pastors at least, and we've got El Dorado folk, and so let's just welcome everyone here tonight and some guests as well. Just a reminder that um, we have services again in here tomorrow night uh, at 6.30. uh, And then on Wednesday night, we will uh, be in special services again, but we'll be doing that out uh, under the amphitheater on the parking lot. So make sure to uh, take advantage of of those services. Just a reminder, I'm trying to see, but we do have Kids Church going on uh, every, every night that we're inside. So... Uh, if you want to take advantage of that, our kids' church is all the way down at the end of the kids' hallway. So um, I think most of the kids have already found their way back there. So amen. Well, I'm going to uh, quickly give you an opportunity to give. So when you came in tonight, there should have been a, a love offering envelope in your seat or within reaching distance of your seat. Uh, if you just take one of those in your hand uh, just for a moment. We are so blessed um, to have David and Miha Norton back. Let them know that you love that they're here. Um, 
It's been almost two and a half years uh, since they were here last. It's hard to believe, but it's been a weird uh, past couple of years. But we are so blessed to have David and Miha back. Uh, they've been coming to be a part of us for, for many, many years, and we just consider them uh, to be family. Uh, I think most of you know them, but they pastor uh, in Romania, three churches in Romania, and they travel internationally and minister, and they give their lives uh, for Jesus. And so uh, they deposit much when they come here, and so we're so thankful that they're here. So uh, just ask the Lord. Let's just take our offering envelope in our hand tonight. And uh, let's just close our eyes and let's just ask the Holy Spirit uh, if he would have us give something, sow something into this good, good ground um, of the Nortons um, and their, their ministry. Father, we just thank you that you've given us the opportunity uh, to receive. Uh, Father, we thank you, God, that you said that you give seed to the sower and you give bread to the eater, God. We want to be those that are generous, God, those that hear your voice and we follow your voice, God, in everything uh, that we do, God. We just, uh, we just agree, God, that you're meeting every need for David and Mehan and the calling that's upon their life, God. God, your blessing, God, upon their life in Jesus' mighty name. So take your envelope there, and if you feel like this is your night to give, go ahead and, and prepare your offering. Um, in just a moment, I'll be turning it over to, how many of you guys were here yesterday afternoon? Yeah, most of you. So you heard the little exchange going on between David and Miha as they were figuring out who was going to be speaking tonight and some of the threats that were going back and forth. Um, so, and that's why you showed up tonight, right? So Miha's got the mic tonight, and she promised she was going to tell us some amazing stories about David, so we're looking forward to that. We got him chained up over there away from the mic so he can't retaliate. So, no. Oh, it's going to be fantastic. Miha is going to be ministering to us tonight, and then David will be back ministering the next two nights uh, as well. So, we're going to pray over the offering. Father, we pray, God, that you would bless every gift that's given. God, multiply it and use it for your glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, show Miha tonight that. Victory loves her, and let's welcome her as she comes to share her heart. about those Los Angeles Bengals. <laughs> what a great game, amen, last night. Well, I truly enjoyed the atmosphere around the game last night. We had a lot of fun. And uh, happy Valentine's Day to everyone. We love Victory Church, Camden, El Dorado, and Pine Bluff. And we're so blessed to be here with all of you. I'm sure that you came tonight because you're very, very curious to hear what I had to say about dating David and being married to David. And since there's only a couple of men, Pastor Jerry, I can go into some interesting details, okay? When I first met David, no, that's not a story that he let me share. When, when we, uh, I'm just joking. It's okay to laugh, amen. <laughs> um, when we were dating, when we started dating, the day before, I had a dream. And I had a dream about every detail, everything that happened. So I was not surprised. Nothing that he did, and he tried to be really romantic, brought me out in town, invited me on this wonderful date, like to go to a coffee shop and have cake and got me flowers and a nice bracelet and walked in the botanical gardens and all that. So I had a dream about all of that. And so it wasn't, it was nice, but not a big surprise. <laughs> and he started praying that uh, God will not give me any more dreams. That, that's not a nice prayer, by the way. 
I enjoy having dreams from the Lord and I do not like to be surprised. So when he pro proposed, I had a dream. <laughs> I guess the Lord loved me very much. I don't know how much he loves David, but I know that he loves me very much. <laughs> and I, uh, I had a dream about where we were going to go. And we, we went there and all of a sudden things started happening that I did not dream about. And I panicked. <laughs> What's happening now? I had no idea. And he, when he proposed, oh, he got a limo in front of the coffee shop. He had a nice... Uh, reservation uh, he had a uh, reserved a table at a nice restaurant he went all out did you hear that uh, brother jerry <laughs> sister tara's husband i mean <laughs> <laughs> i love my husband let's say that together i love my husband it's good to say that if you're a woman <laughs> And if you're a guy, just say, I really love my wife. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What a night. So good to be in, in the house of the Lord together. We've had such a good time. Today I got to do laundry to catch up with all of that. Sometimes you have to do what you have to do on Valentine's Day, man. <laughs> but I would love to open the word tonight in Romans in chapter 16. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I enjoyed praise and worship tonight. Whew. You know when we started dating. My husband was so well behaved. I, um, I talked to my pastors that I wanted a meeting with them. Because, should I say it, babe? It's okay. I'll say it anyway. I, uh, I, I said, I have to talk to my pastors. I want him to hold my hand and to kiss me. I know that's shocking to say I'm here with the mic. I, um, we are Romanians Latin. We are the only Latin country in Eastern Europe. And Latin women, they enjoy being kissed. And David is German blood. There's a big difference between Germans and Latins. So David, after that, he decided that he is still well behaved, even if he holds my hand. <laughs> I think this was the story that I was not supposed to share tonight. We'll blame it on the jet lag. <laughs> Romans 16, help us, Lord, amen. Sometimes, David, because he knows me really good, and back at home, I laugh so much when I preach, and I joke around a lot with people, and he tells me, you're in a mood tonight. <laughs> I know exactly what he means, and I'm still surprised that he's right there in the front seat row. <laughs> It's wonderful to be married. It's only getting better in time as we allow the Lord to change us. Romans chapter 16, verse 1. I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sancria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. of people like you and like me that were together with Paul and Paul knew them by their names. 
their names are more difficult to pronounce than my name. <laughs> I know sometimes it's hard to pronounce Mihaela. I think it's so easy. So that's why we say Miha. Everybody back at home calls me Miha. But here there are some very interesting names. It's hard for me to pronounce those names. A list of people that have worked hard for the gospel. And Paul, for many of them, he mentions this word, my beloved. We're talking today a little bit about love and serving in love and working together in love, in the love of God. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, for your word. You are the word that came down from heaven to feed our lives to give us hope, give us eternal life, to help us on our daily walk. You are the manna that we can go and get every single day, and it's enough. That manna is enough for us. So I pray that you help me tonight, Holy Spirit. And we, we want your presence, Holy Spirit. We need you tonight in this meeting so that you touch every person, every couple, Every servant, every child, every woman, every man, anyone that's in, in this place tonight, and anyone that will listen to this message later on, that you will touch every soul through these words. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in St. Korea. Many people believe that Paul wrote this letter while he was in Corinth. And the letter to the Romans is a beautiful letter. Many call it the masterpiece. It's the first letter that is mentioned after the book of Acts. It's the longest letter that Paul wrote. It's a very theological, very profound, um, phenomenal letter where Paul explains what the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ means, where he goes in the depth of our Christian belief systems. It's such a wonderful letter. And right there at the end of his letter in chapter 16, he says, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in St. Korea. She was probably, many believe, part of the team that brought this letter to Rome, a team that left Corinth and went to Rome, and some even think that she was the one carrying the letter. Can you imagine what it felt like to have that letter in your hands? I was wondering, did she know that it mentioned her name, that it was talking about her? Did she know what the letter contained? I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister. It was a valuable letter. It, it was not an easy thing to write during those days. It actually cost Paul probably in our daily money thousands of dollars to write a letter. They did not have emails. They didn't have cell phones. They did not have too many books and not too many people who were educated. Not too many knew how to even write or read. That's why manuscripts were very valuable, more precious sometimes than jewelry. Some men think, yes, I'm going to buy her a book now. She was holding on to this letter. It says in Psalm 14, verse 7, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. It's not just any letter. It's a letter that later on became the very word of God. And it was mentioning her name, just as the other names that we can read about in this chapter. Cicero, who was a very strong orator, he wrote his longest letter had 2,530 words. 
Seneca, a great philosopher, his longest letter had 4,134 words. But the book of Romans, this letter, it has 7,114 words. It was a very special letter. And it mentioned these people that were together with Paul in love. I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, she's part of our family, a servant of the church in Sancria, a deaconess, first woman deaconess mentioned in the Bible, a leader in the church. What a great reputation, a helper. Sancria, her town, the town that she was um, leading a church in, probably alongside other believers, was a port about nine miles away from Corinth. That's close enough. And Corinth had a very bad reputation during that time. People were making a lot of money and there was a lot of sin. And Sancria was a lot worse than Corinth. Can you imagine what it means to be a Christian in a town like that? The price that she had to pay during those days to become a Christian. And what it meant for her to be a leader in the church in Sancria. In the middle of all of that darkness that was around her, for sure she shone with the light of Christ. How did that church start? We don't know for sure when it started, but we know that Paul was in Corinth. And he wa went there and stayed, like I mentioned yesterday a little bit, with a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. Stayed in Corinth for about a year and eight months, maybe a little bit more. And as he was working alongside Aquila and Priscilla, they were also ten makers. Same, they had the same trade. He started reaching out to people in the community, first in the synagogue, and then to other people to preach the gospel. Paul was originally from Tarsus, a city in the region of Cilicia, famous for raising goats and producing a goat's hair cloth that was used in tent making. The cloth was named Cilicium after the province of origin. What they would do, they would weave goat or ca camel hair to produce uh, pieces of cloth. Then they uh, sewed the cloth together to make tents for travelers. My grandmother, on my father's side, she was, um, uh, as a trade, she would make uh, tapestry that people would hang on the wall like quilts, or they would put on a bed. And I loved going there and playing in my grandma's house. They would have, she would have like a big rack for thread, where first they would put a thread and uh, on that tall rack, and then they would move the thread on the loom. It was a long process that required many, many hours. A lot of patience. She allowed me to help and she was teaching me things as I was working there. And uh, after they put all of the thread on the loom, you take like the weaver shuttle. And uh, that was the fun part because you got to move that weaver shuttle th through all of the threads. I don't know if any of you ever worked on a loom before, but it's a lot of fun. And at the beginning, it doesn't look like much. It looks just like some thread. And as you work on that thread, soon enough, you're going to see the pattern forming. In front of her eyes, the whole time, she had a pattern that she was working on. And as she was taking the weaver shuttle, she would look at the pattern to see how much she would have to go straight or three threads and then two threads because she was following a pattern. You wouldn't see from the beginning what was happening. Just some color and maybe a little 
flower that will show a little bit of petals that will show. But then a whole tapestry will be made. It looked beautiful. I still have some of her tapestries in our house, in my parents' house. One of them I really love is a black tapestry that has these big red tulips. And I know that my grandma made it. And I was there when she was working on it. When I was in preschool, my mom sent me to kindergarten when I was three years old and then allowed me to go to school only when I was seven years old. And I got so bored in preschool. I don't know how many kids run away from preschool, but I ran away from preschool. My grandma's house was close to the kindergarten. So when the te I would ask my teacher, can I go and use the bathroom? And I would run to my grandma's house. My teacher knew exactly where to find me. She always came and for some reason, she knew where I was hiding. And I'm sure that my grandma told her. <laughs> One day I remember I went to, I ran away again from preschool and went in my grandma's house and she was so busy that day. She didn't have time for me. She was a very patient woman, very kind. My mom says that she, she had the best mother-in-law. And I say, no, I have the best mother-in-law. Mama Joan is phenomenal. And I love my mother-in-law just as a mom. And so did my mom. She loved her mother-in-law as a mother. I went to my grandma's house that day and I was trying to play. And she said to me, I don't have time. Later on, maybe you can come back tomorrow. Go back to your preschool. I didn't want to and I started getting upset. I started having an attitude. And I took a pair of scissors. And I looked in my grandma's eyes and she said, no, 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 no. She kept on working. I said, I'm telling you, I'm going to cut all of these threads. Let me play. I was not a very nice child. And my grandma didn't want to play with me. And I didn't understand that she had work to do that day. She didn't have time to play with me. So I took the scissors and sure enough, I cut all of those threads. Now, not only that it's hard to put those threads together, but once you already started working on the tapestry, then you have to tie them, each and every single one of them, in a very special way so that it will not show in the final pattern. My grandma had tears in her eyes that day. I, I don't think that I ever remember seeing her cry, but I almost made my grandma cry. And I think that sometimes us as people in our marriages, in our churches, just because things are not done the way that we'd like and we'd prefer, we come up with an attitude, we start acting mean, and we take a pair of scissors, and we cut relationships. People that we have worked with for many years, soon enough, they're gone. And when I think of my grandma and what I did that day, I can think of the Lord, of our God, of our Father. Do you know how much work it takes to bring us all together? He brought you to this church. I don't know where all of you are coming from, but there was a journey for you to get here, for you to become a part of this body, for, you, for Camden, for South Arkansas. It's in his heart. And it's been taking him years to bring us all together. He's been weaving us together. He's been knitting us together. He's been working on this pattern all of these years. Because of his vision. 
what he wants to do because of the revival that he wants to bring. He brought you next to that man. He brought you next to that woman because of a pattern that's in his heart, because of something that's in his mind for those families, for your children. Too many times we take the scissors in our hands. The whole chapter in Romans 16 is full of names of people that have impacted Paul's life and the life of the church during that time. And this whole chapter weaves them together. It's a list of men and women, slaves and free, if we read a little bit about their own histories, old and young, workers together in God's beautiful field. Each name belongs to a person, a mother, a father, a person that had dreams, a person that had a past, they had their own struggles, they have skills, gifts, they have ministries, they have a job. Sometimes God calls a David, a Joshua, he calls a Moses, he calls a Matthew, tax collector. And sometimes he calls somebody like Phoebe, a woman, or Aquila, or all of these other people that we hear maybe a little bit too little about. Here is Paul, a Jewish man, an apostle, writing to a church in Rome about a Greek woman, Phoebe is a Greek name. The three most important cultures at the time, they are joined together in a couple of verses. Chapter 16, verse 1 and 2 in the book of Romans. A Jewish man, an apostle, can you imagine what it took for him to write to a church in Rome about a Greek woman? It's a paradox. It's the place where grace comes and meets hearts and brings hearts together. And only the grace of God could have done that. He's saying here, give her everything that she needs. This is exactly what he's saying. Assist her in whatever business she has need of you. Does she need a guitar? Give her that guitar. Does she need a coat? Give her that coat. Give her the resources, the people that she needs so that she can do the work that God has called her to do. She doesn't need to be mistreated, discouraged, criticized, envied. She has a job to do and it involves the kingdom of God. Are we going, all of us, are we going to help Phoebe working next to her, our fellow sister, could be also our fellow brother. She could be the person that had just joined our praise and worship team or the sound system or the kids ministry and they don't know too many things about the ins and outs of how we're doing things. Are we going to help them figure things out? That person can be the new, your new co-worker. Are you going to be threatened by that person? Or are you going to help them succeed? That can be maybe the next prophetic voice in your church. The person that God raises up and he uses that person in a mighty way. Maybe of a different color than me. Am I going to help them succeed? Or am I going to stop them? When I went to college in our city many, many years ago, I didn't know our city it's, has 500,000 people. There's a girl coming from a village. I left home when I was 14 to go to a small town. I've been a, kind of on my own, on my feet since I was 14, but 
my small town where I went to high school was really small compared to the city where I went to college. And I didn't know the streets. I didn't know where to go for grocery shopping and all of that. And first day in college, this girl, she was from Cluj, from our city. Her name is Adriana. This girl just calls my name because somehow we got to meet during our exams to get into college. She calls my name and she says, I just want you to sing next to me every single day when we are in college. She became my best friend. She invited me over to her house and her mom would cook for us. And do you know how wonderful it is when you're a student to have somebody cook for you a good meal? And uh, she showed me all of the streets and we had so much fun. And I brought her to church with me. And that's how she got saved. She lives in Canada today with her husband. She lives in Montreal. But I, I think about um, what it means to help somebody else, to make room for them. Are we going to help Phoebe, that one person? Or are, are we really going to you know, love fiercely, care tremendously? Get over, our own, get over our own insecurities. Move mountains out of the way so that person can have success in life, in ministry. It's a good question, I think, for all of us. Because behind Paul's words, behind those two verses... It's not too many, it's just two. And some of the rest of them, they just got to be mentioned here a little bit, their names. There is a life. Behind those words, there is a life of ministry. A person that has dedicated their life to the Lord. Can you imagine to have Paul recommend you to other believers? I don't think that he did that lightly. When he said, help her with whatever she needs, I don't think that he did that lightly. When he said, she helped me and she helped so many other people. It wasn't just a, you know, once in a while. She came to church once and she acted nice. She served the Lord for a year and that's it. I'm happy whenever people get saved. I always rejoice. My joy is when people say I've been walking with the Lord for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years, for 50 years. Are we going to acknowledge those people that are among us, our pastors, they have worked for how many years serving the Lord? It takes a lot. It takes a lifestyle of serving, of sacrifice. He is writing this letter to the church in Rome. You know, it was a letter that made a big difference in my life once. When I was 14 and I left the small village, uh, we were a German village, and I had a very good friend, Astrid is her name, and she lives in Germany now, but she left when she was 14 to go with her family in Germany. And she told me, I want you to write to this girl in the United States so that you can improve your English. And that girl, we started writing to each other, no emails again at the time, no cell phones at the time. We'd write a letter, we'd get a letter a month later or three months later on. And I started writing with this girl named Jessica Ewing. She lives in Illinois. And she, we were, we'd write about basketball and all types of things and music that we both liked. And when I got saved, when I was 19 years old, I wrote her in my letter about the Lord and how I got saved. Three months later, I received her letter. I will never forget it. And she said, this is how she started. I'm crying right now, she said. I, I ran to get my mother to bring her so that she can hear because she says, three months before I got your letter, I got saved. 
And every single day since then, I've been praying together with my mother for you. That girl from the United States of America that I still have not met face to face was the one that prayed for me to get saved together with her mother. A letter. When we were dating, me and David, <laughs> we'd write letters to each other. We had email at the time, but it was an effort to send an email. We did not have an, a computer. I didn't have a computer in my house, and he was living in Russia at the time. He did not have a computer where he was, was staying. So we'd write each other once a week an email. And uh, he had to take a bus to go to an internet cafe. It took him a whole hour to get there. And in the middle of a Russian winter, if you thought that last two weeks were cold, it's nothing. In the middle of the Russian winter, it was really cold. I have no idea in Fahrenheit, but it was minus, minus a lot of degrees. He would have to walk to the bus station, get on that bus, then walk from the other bus station to the internet cafe. Sometimes it was working well, sometimes it was not working very well to send me an email, a letter, a love letter. Well, I'm not going to go into the details of what he would write at the end. See, I'm behaving tonight. <laughs> We're talking tonight about a letter of love that Paul wrote about the love of God and about the love that should be among us all as we work together. Right before, in Romans 15, he's asking the church in Rome to pray for him. Now I beg you in verse 30. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be accept acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. That's how much he couldn't wait to go to Rome. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Those letters at the time would take days to be written. He probably thought, I'm finishing my letter. Many times this is how he would end his letter. Amen. And he thought probably, I finished my letter now. But then, I don't know, next day or when, he says, oh, I need to write something else. I need to write to them about these people. I know them by their, by their names. I love them with my whole heart. We have been working together for so many years. I know their children. I know their grandchildren. I will always love them. I want to tell you about them. And then in chapter 16, after he writes about the love that is between them, Says, he says in verse 20, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. As we come together, as we work together in love, our God is going to crush the enemy underneath our feet. As we serve honoring each other, preferring each other, the devil is our enemy. And as we come together... In love, serving, helping each other. Our God is going to crush our enemy underneath our feet. Whatever your enemy is. Whatever you have been struggling with. No matter what came against your marriage. As we show love. As we serve each other. Help each other. Our God. Is going to crush our enemy 
underneath our feet. And I'll end with 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Amen. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Every weapon formed against you shall not prosper. Any weapon that the enemy had against this church will not prosper. Any weapon formed by the enemy against the church in El Dorado will not prosper. Any weapon formed by the enemy against the church in Pine Bluff will not prosper. Who, any weapon formed, the en- formed by the enemy against marriages or children will not prosper because of our love for each other. Because of our love for each other. There is so much power in the love of Christ that unites us. There is so much power in in that love that comes from heaven. It's a love that is stronger than death itself. It's a love that is powerful. Oh Father, take away the scissors from our hands. And help us to weave threads together so that we can shape the pattern that you have for our community. We want your vision and not our own, your plans and not our own. Come, Holy Spirit, and give us vision for revival. And give us vision for the move of God. You said that as we love each other, people will know. They will know that we belong to you. So we pray that love will move mountains. That love will heal hearts. That love will compel us to serve each other with the gifts that you had given us. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Let love heal hearts. Let love heal marriages. Let love heal every relationship we pray. You said that this is, this is your only command. That we love you. And that we love each other. That's all that you ask of us. We have complicated it too much. We pray that you fill us anew with your love. You know, where it says in the very beginning of the Bible that for this reason will a man leave his father and mother and he will cling to his wife and the two will become one flesh where it says that they he will cling or he'll he'll be joined together it's actually a word that means knit knit together knit together by the hands of God relationships built by the love of God's by the very hands of God himself it's it's the spirit that unites us it's God's love that brings us together with ligaments of love. Do you know that Miha said to her grandma after that, I'm going to stay and I'm going to help you put it all back together again. And she worked with her for hours to put it back together again. 
We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Not just to forgive, not just to let bygones be bygones, but to actually see relationships being restored by the love of God, by His grace. Hallelujah. Let's just begin to worship the Lord together as we're in His presence. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life to me you have been so so kind to me Oh 